<laughs> Welcome, people on the internet. This is St. Joseph Radio Presents, and you're hearing the recorded version. This is the live version. We're going to talk about natural law today. What, what, what's natural law? Mm -hmm. It is the law of God implanted in our hearts, but it's going to be in the context of God's divine law, uh, eternal law, family law, church law, and then even civil law. So it's going to be kind of a roundabout memory aid defense. D. F-E-N-C-E. -E. Something Fence. to remember. Right. <laughs> hey, tune in. You're going to like it. We'll see you. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, that was Matt Logaman, and I'm your host today, Peter Cruz. Today's program is Natural Law. We're here live with uh, our good friend and frequent speaker, Mr. <laughs> what are you going to say your last name? Miller. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you, you're the DRE over at uh, ICDS? No, at uh, the Immaculate Heart Mary. Immaculate Heart Mary. I said it the wrong <laughs> Which thing. is Sorry. the feast day today. It is Feast of Immaculate Heart Mary? Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. That's why at Mass we say, sold two Marians, <laughs> sang two Marian songs, Immaculate Heart Mary. What a great day. And we just had the Sacred Heart of Jesus a yeah. day or so ago. But today's program is on... Well, it's going to be on law in general, divine law, natural law, civil law, church law. It's going to be kind of an overall encompassing uh, introduction to law, which is really fitting when you think about this past month. Uh, all these recent feasts that we've had and, and events, obviously it's it's June 25th here, and we just had the Supreme Court decision, so we want to kind of mention that too yeah. with Roe versus Wade uh, being overturned. But, um, you know, let's, let's go back to kind of like uh, June 5th, Feast of Pentecost, right? That's a celebration where we have this great feast where we get this new law of love foretold from the beginning, God giving us his spirit that's going to dwell inside us as believers. The law is no longer going to be on stone. Uh, it's, it's now going to be in, you know, engraved in our hearts. This is the spirit of God. <clears throat> then that next week we celebrated the Feast of the Holy Trinity, and that's the source of all love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead. You think about each of the persons of the Trinity. God the Father is the, like God the Creator, all the physical laws, the summit of which is a human person, which is, has this spiritual law within them, this natural moral law. You think of God the Son, Christ coming in flesh to give us this law of love that he teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount which is really the Magna Carta of all he taught. It was the new Moses giving us this new law. And then the promised Holy Spirit, which that law then comes and dwells within us. So outside, B-side, inside, Holy Trinity. And then the, the week that followed, uh, June the 19th, Feast of Corpus Christi. This is kind of the tangible love of God given to us to uh, fulfill what he asked us to do at the Last Supper is to love one another as I have loved you. I'm not just going to command you. I'm going to give you the way to do it. And the principal way we know in the church where the Spirit animates physical realities is in the gift of the Holy Eucharist. So those, those three great feasts kind of precluded of, of a few things. Uh, recently, uh, on June 22nd, we had the Feast of St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. If you haven't watched the movie A Man for All Seasons, that's a great reflection of just about keeping law in the midst of chaotic times, you know, and and really that's a prelude to what happened um, on June 24th. The Feast of the Most Sacred Heart is when the Supreme Court, uh, thanks be to God, finally overturned Roe versus Wade. 63 million children since that 1973 decision have been uh, taken from us. And um, <clears throat> the decision that the court gave, uh, I thought it was so fitting because, you know, like my wife had said, this is on the feast of the most sacred beating heart of Jesus. June 24th is the traditional feast of the Nativity of John the Baptist. You think about that scene in the visitation where when the first, when John the Baptist first encountered the Lord, it was in the womb and there was life. And they both recognize that. So um, what a gift of all those who have been praying and working to try and have this. It's really a victory for the Constitution. It's a victory for law to get back to common sense that we no longer just say, I've got a policy that I want. And where can we kind of invent this in the Constitution? I read the whole 213-page decision of, 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 of the court, both the majority opinion, the concurring opinions, and the dissents. Some of it's legalese, but uh, well, a lot of it is legalese. But, but fundamentally, <laughs> it is something that's written on your heart. And you know what? And in this country that we live in, we believe in, and you mentioned the word earlier, subsidiarity. Yeah. States will make a decision. So... The, the, if you will, the issue is not over. Abortion is not outlawed through right. all 50 states. We still have to seek 
to change minds and hearts. Mm. And maybe this is an opportunity. I mean, I'm going to speak to everyone here for just a second. I think it's not too much of an exaggeration to su suggest that each and every one of us, each and every one of us have been touched by abortion in some way, either committing it, facilitating it, being silent about it, knowing someone who's had it, mm -hmm. had an abortion or multiple abortions. Uh, you know what? It's a time we can recognize that there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Go to confession. Encourage someone to go to confession and realize that our Lord is like, in a, as the, said in the prodigal son, running to meet you, mm -hmm. looking for you. He's been waiting for you all this time. Go to confession, find peace. I think that of all the people I've spoken to who have had abortions, who are really, really suffering all these years, that's the one thing that they have not found, peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is peace in God's forgiveness. God can forgive any sin except the one you won't bring to him. So please, ask for forgiveness. And, and, and before we get started, because we're going to, by the way, I don't know if we can cover this in an hour. It's, we're going to be going forever. But uh, we always try and start with a prayer. Um, and I'm wondering if you might have one. Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, you are the great lawgiver, both on stone and in our hearts and minds. We invoke your Holy Spirit and the gift of his law of love to anoint this conversation we're having here. And we pray for all upon whom these words will fall. We thank you in advance, and we ask this through Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Yes, All right, Sean, where yeah. are we going well, here? Well, here's the deal. So like St. Thomas More, you know, I, I think about him um, just because of what he had to stand up against. We all know that any time in family, church, state, when you stand up for anything, you're going to take some heat. You know, sure. like if you stand up to your kids, you're going to say, I hate you for a while. If you stand up, whatever. We all know like this, even the threats against the Supreme Court justices here. I mean, this is just part and parcel of the game. I mean, law is not always a warm, fuzzy one for the people that kind of defend it, you know? Like they're talking about defund the police. We really got to defend the police because they're the ones that are standing up for law. But I, I thought about um, Thomas More and what he had to undergo just to stand up against the king. I think about uh, Justice Anthony Scalia and oh, his, yeah. his, his great, you know, all of his dissents and all these cases over the years, they, they've just been profound. And, uh, and I love what he said that, you know, he, he had this line that I, it was at his funeral that Justice Ginsburg had said that, uh, you know, him and her had a, had a good friendship, but they obviously disagreed ideologically on just about everything. And, right. and then he, he said that his line was, or she said his line was, some very good people can have some very bad ideas. And, you know, and we just got to realize that, that in a plurality of ideas, you know, we got to stand for what is the truth. And, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to come by and find it takes work, but it also takes courage. You know, but it's good when I was reading the Supreme Court decision that uh, there was much discussion about the word liberty. You know, you think about what we're going to be celebrating July 4th, Independence Day, in this, in this liberty, but Justice Alito spoke of ordered liberty, you know, and this is in contrast to, like, back the decision that was overturned Roe and Casey. In Casey, 1992, Justice Kennedy had wrote these words. He said, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Well, that's like an open-ended uh you know, validation of, of anything goes, you know, if I say I'm this, then I'm this, you know, if I say I'm a seven foot, seven year old Chinese woman, then, then by fiat, I am. If I say that now I'm an inheritor to a billionaire's uh, will, then I'm going to show up and demand that you give me my right to the inheritance. I mean, it's kind of ab absurd on its face, but like Justice Alito had said that we got to go back to like ordered liberty. And um, that kind of kind of goes into what our conversation today is in terms of we're talking about freedom. Like this weekend's second reading, Paul says in, in Galatians, like he said, for freedom, Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So he's kind of talking, first of all, about freedom from the Mosaic law. We'll speak more about that in a second. But he goes on to say, like, you know, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Like basically saying Christ has set you free in this new law of love and the new covenant. But it doesn't mean that you're free from like moral law, doing the right thing, you know, that the Ten Commandments are out the door. So he says, you know, don't gratify the desires of, of the flesh. But he says Christ did come to kind of free you from some of the burdens and the ceremonies and the rituals of the Mosaic law, but he didn't mean to take away the natural law. He's going to elevate that in the Sermon on the Mount and really to be have freedom for excellence, freedom for virtue. Freedom to do, as St. John Paul said, freedom is not 
the ability to do anything you want, but it's to do what you ought. Yeah. So it's great that we've got these laws in stone, and now we've got this law in the heart. So like in a couple of weeks, in the 15th Sunday uh, in Ordinary Time, we've got the question, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? You know, and then it's it's the great thing about you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, all your strength, and love your neighbor um, as yourself. So, so here's here's the big kicker is that, you know, how do I love God? You know, if I want to go to heaven, what is expected of me? You know, what is my response supposed to be? And it's like, oh, is it just this warm, vague, have a nice feeling towards all people? Or is there, is this law of love somewhat kind of defined, you know, given? And so, like, we've got promptings of the Spirit in our hearts, but we also have this massive body of instruction and guidelines. So, like, the catechism, like, if you read section 1950 and following, it speaks about the moral law. And he says, it says basically, the moral law, it's like fatherly instruction. We all know as fathers, you know, like, here's, here's the way. Here's the railroad tracks. I give you reason. I give you revelation. Like the old show, Father Knows Best. I mean, this is God the Father Knows Best. So he's the one that's going to lay out these tracks for us and that he's going to let us, because we're made in his image. I mean, law in and of itself, it's a participation in the very mind of God. We've got rationality to share in God's reason. So we can kind of ponder what's right, what's wrong using our reason. But just in case we don't get it, he's also revealed certain things, too. So we'll say it's these two tracks, railroad tracks, of reason and revelation. So the, the norm of human conduct, it's, it's kind of guided by these two, two tracks. So like we were talking before the show that, you know, if you look at, let's just say, the Ten Commandments, you know, like there's two tables. The first three have to do with God, and the second seven have to do with kind of relationship with man. I mean, everybody should kind of know you shall not kill, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not cheat, because we all don't want those things to be done to us, right? That's a part of our natural being. We all know if we're lied to or cheated to, if there's adultery, that's that's a wrong thing. But just in case we don't get it, God has revealed it. So just like it's the sticker on the hairdryer, right? You know, it says, we should know that you don't use this thing and plug it and put it in water if it's plugged in, yeah, but just in case you don't get it. Yeah. They got that sticker there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's the case. We go off track. We got this way to kind of set us right. So uh, there's this great quote from a book called Catholicism for Dummies, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just oh, a good yeah, yeah, yeah. That, good, uh, good, little quote here. Yeah, good good book. Two good, two good priests who wrote it. Yeah. He said, it says, from all eternity, God has willed that all things act according to their nature. Created things obey the laws of nature, physics, math, chemistry, gravity, and so on. Animals obey their instincts, and humans obey, or at least ought to, and act according to their nature, which is rational. Mm -hmm. Being rational creatures, humans are called to obey authentic laws that conform to reason, are made known, and exist for the common good. So they talk about this eternal law that's nothing more than the combination of all laws that conform to reason and exist for the common good of everyone. So as we go through this... We're going to be speaking about that ultimately these, all, all these laws flow from this eternal law, this mind of God, and they're broken down in revelation and reason. So there's divine law, Mosaic law, Ten Commandments, family law, there's ecclesiastical church law, natural moral law, civil law. So I've got the memory aid is defense. So if you go to a football game or whatever game, you might see two people holding up signs. One's holding the D and one's holding up a fence, you know. And, and I, I use this because of the acronym uh, F-E-N-C-E. So, again, family law, ecclesiastical law, natural law, civil law, eternal law. But um, a fence is fitting to really show what the law is. I mean, a fence, as we're going to see, kind of provides and protects and, and I'm going to talk about that. So that's just the memory aid to kind of have it in your mind as we go through this. You always have a good memory aid. So, <laughs> well, it's the takeaway, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about natural law, I kind of break it down simply for me because I used to play basketball. And uh, if I had a basketball hoop in my house when, when I got one, and I did, but if the ball doesn't have enough air in it, mm-hmm. right, it, it, uh, it doesn't bounce well. And I can't play basketball well with it. And I look at the ball. The ball isn't being all that it can be, mm-hmm. right? In fact, if I bounce the ball and it hits the ground and stays there, I'll say that this basketball is disordered. It's out of order, mm-hmm. right? So natural law is extraordinarily rational and in, in, um, 
intuitive almost, right? God is not telling us no in all these things. He's telling us yes. He wants us to be the best we can be. And sometimes our, our uh, uh, original sin causes us to have disorders, right? And, and it doesn't mean we're broken. Well, maybe it does. But it means that we can be more, mm-hmm. right? God wants us to be all we can be. This is St. Joseph Radio Presents coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. We're here with Sean Miller, and we are talking about uh, the law and the acronym or the uh, memory aid is defense, focusing <laughs> on fence, family law, ecclesial law, natural law, church law, and yeah, it was civil law and civil then law. all flowing from the eternal law. Eternal the, law. The I, I'll get it. We got a we got a few <laughs> more minutes to go. <laughs> so just a little story here to start out with. So there was this. Speaking of fence, um, one night this burglar jumped over a fence and broke into this house. Uh, he was tiptoeing through the living room, but suddenly he froze when he heard a voice say, "Jesus is watching you." After a few minutes of waiting, silence returned. Was that his conscience? So the burglar crept forward again. Jesus is watching you, the voice spoke again. The burglar stopped dead in his tracks. He was nervous, frightened. Frantically, he looked all around. In a dark corner, he pointed his flashlight and spotted a bird cage, and in the cage was a parrot. He saw the bird's beak move, and then out of its mouth came the words, Jesus is watching you. In a sigh of relief, the burglar said, It's just you, you dumb parrot. In anger, he was ready to reach into the cage to strangle the bird when he heard a low, deep growl coming from another corner of the house. When he turned the flashlight to where the noise was coming from, it rested upon a huge black dog, foaming at the mouth, staring at him, ready to pounce. Whereupon the parrot said, sick him, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. I I say that just because, you know, when you read the catechism, it says that the law really focuses on Christ. It finds its perfection in Christ. I mean, we think of God as a great lawgiver to Moses, but Jesus is ultimately the new Moses, the great lawgiver. So... In Christ, the Word becomes flesh, and He reveals this new law of love, the Sermon on the Mount. Then He gives us the sacraments and the Spirit to live this out. He gives us the why and shows us the way. So like, kind of like one of the key points that I do want to make here today is that, you know, you, you, you think about this, uh, like this past year at the Easter Vigil, there's this line from Baruch, which we don't hardly ever read in the year, and it's said that, Blessed are we, O Israel, for what pleases God is known to us. So, like, um, if you ever heard of a guy named Frank Sheed, he, he, he wrote this book called Theology and Sanity, and he says, basically, you know, left to ourselves, we can't know too much, you know, about why we're here, what's the purpose, how to get where we're supposed to be going, etc. He said, then the universe simply happened, and men are parts of the happening, is unmeant and, un- and unpurposed at it, as it. He said, but there is a mind, and through Christ, we can know what the mind has in mind. We can know what life is about. We can try to live accordingly. It is a very great luxury. So, you know, I always love the, uh, the um, image of Christ, the teacher, to think about he's revealed this law, which is the path, the way, and that we can walk in it and we can actually strive to be all that we're meant to be. You know, like I, I hear all the time, oh, he's a good person. Oh, she's a good person. You know, and I always, I always go back to this definition that something is good when it fulfills the purpose for which it was made. So how can you be good if you're not fulfilling the purpose or you don't even know what purpose for which you've been made? So, I mean, that's the gift of the law. So, like, if you think about the, um, the Psalms, you know, like Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks down in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he medita- meditates day and, day and night. So there's all of these psalms that talk about how the law of the Lord is perfect, it revives his soul. You know, show me your will, O Lord. The law of, of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold. It's my delight. Your words, Lord, are spirit and life. So you're like, it just really praises the law. And it's because, you know, it gives us the ability to know who God is. We don't have to figure this out just kind of on our own. We've got this, this gift, reason and revelation in how to live in this ordered way. So then the question becomes, are we even concerned about what, what pleases God? You know, I, it's interesting that we, you don't hear much about law because it's always seen as this negative thing. But it's like, if we think about this is the way that God loves us, like a father giving instruction to his children, do we trust the father's kind of plan or do we see it as this negative? I mean, you just think about offense. Do you see it as like something that's going to restrict and constrict or something that's going to provide 
a, a playground and also protect me in some way from the outside world. Freedom, yeah, freedom. Imagine a, um, a soccer field that's built on the edge of cliffs on mm-hmm. two sides. Yeah. And you put up, and everyone's a little concerned about kicking the ball and getting too close, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's a great deal of anxiety. But if there's a big fence and a a wall, if you will, a big fence, we'll call it, right along the edge, you have freedom. Yeah, you can enjoy the game. To be all you can be in there. You can play it, yeah. And we're going to be speaking more about the kind of the sports analogy, too. But, um, you know, one of the things I, I always try to keep at the forefront of my mind day in, day out, is that, you know, Christ has come not just to lay down the law, we've heard that term, but he, but he comes also to lay down himself as a sacrifice to give us the power to keep the law of God, to follow the promptings of the Spirit. I got this picture here where it's got these two sides, kind of like the, um, if, you, if you think about the Grand Canyon, either side, and it's kind of like it's got a picture of, of Christ and his arms laid out, and he's the bridge between each side, kind of like, you know, God and man, is that he is the bridge to restore us, to, to kind of show us the way. But but his sacrifice is is what made this bridge possible. Now, I always think to myself, like what I was saying is that when I look at a crucifix, I always got to um, think about it, that if God came down, not just to be our teacher, but to be a sacrificial offering, and if you look at a crucifixion, and it's unbelievably horrible and tragic what he went through, that he must have wanted to save us from something unbelievably horrible and tragic. And we know as believers what that is. That is life apart from God. That's hell. That is evil. That, that, is, that is ugliness. That is everything despairing of, about. I mean, all of life is done. You're, you're, the life project is over. You are completely estranged from God. And then look at what he would do to both come as teacher and as redeemer to give us this law to, and to lay it down in a life of love. That is the bridge. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to have that gift, to have this you know, verbal communication in the Sermon on the Mount and how to live, as well as to also have the sacrificial gift that paid so I can have this ability to walk across, and I've got kind of a guideline to make it happen. So, you know, I just would say, do we ever even think about examining our conscience in light of this law to say, am, am I living in accord with it? Do I even treasure it? Do I try to just thwart it because I don't want someone to restrict my freedom? Do I have that view of God as like a, a traffic cop wanting to crush my freedom or a parent that wants just to say no and I can't do what I want when I want how I want? You know, it's like we've got a real perverted sense of, of law in our country. You know, I mean, granted, there's been abuses and there's over, you know, burning and bureaucracy and, and abuse and, and kind of, you know, defending the law at times. But it's like, come on. This is a father's love. So like what I was saying before in this, in this, uh, I mean, I got a few images here, but the first one is a fence. Like I remember when my kids were young, they were out, we were going to, I don't know, play or whatever. They're probably each, you know, three or four years old and uh, they're kind of walking. And then I kicked the ball. Well, then we live kind of by a well-traveled road. I mean, growing up, I'd still live on this road. We had probably had about 15 animals run over. And so I have this visual going through my mind about my kids getting run over. So immediately I said, all right, I got to build a chain link fence, you know? So we built this whole fence around our yard and it, it made all the difference in the world for both to protect them and to give them this beautiful playground, kind of what you were saying about the soccer field. So that's one image. But then if you think about law, like you take the word, you spell it backwards. You think about wall. I mean, we're have a big debate in our country of, of, about the wall, build the wall, right? President Trump and do we kind of secure our borders? What does is, what is a uh, you know wall mean? They always talk about, well, no, don't build walls, build bridges. You know, I say, why not have both? You know, because like uh, I read this one note, it says, heaven has a wall, a gate, and a strict immigration policy. Hell has <laughs> open borders. Let that sink in. <laughs> Oh boy, you better read that again. I, I, I had not. Who, who said that? It was on. It was in some newspaper ad. It said, "Heaven has a wall, a gate, and a strict immigration policy. Hell has open borders." Let that wow. sink in. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, when when you've got this vision of uh, revelation that John has. He sees the, you know, the eternal city coming down. He talks about this vision of these walls. And it's, it's great to think about, like, you know, Bishop Barron had a talk where we, on, on this. He said, walls kind of stand for identity. You know, it's like, this is who we are as a society. And then there's gates, and the gates stand for access. So that, like, you think about the church, 
you know, or, or even our country. You know, walls help protect its identity, but it's also got to have gates to be able to reach out and to welcome others in. But if you just have open borders, then it's kind of like, who are we? Where are we? What are, What is the rule of, of, of law? I mean, you know, and it's interesting to me, everybody that's all for just, you know, open immigration and whatnot. I mean, we always want to welcome the stranger, of course. We, we want to do legally for the sake of the country, but it's like, does anybody leave their doors unlocked at night and say, anybody come in, take what you want in the fridge? You know, so there's that balance, right? There's walls and there's gates, sure. you know? So it's like, here we are as identity, but also we also want to have access. So like I always say, good fences make good neighbors. They do. Sometimes, you know, we got to say, we got to protect ourselves to kind of make sure that we're secure, but then we also want to be open uh, to other people as well. So um, if you go to the Catechism, 1975, it again reiterates that law is a fatherly instruction. And I, I love that because I always think about, you know, one of the biggest dilemmas of our day, it's, it's fatherhood. And really, fathers stand for kind of the law, you know. I mean, it's not to exclude men and women in, in overlapping roles, but it's like, you know, women have the gift of, of love in a unique way. It's like love and law, tough and tender, heart and head, mercy, justice. These things overlap, but typically you see this, this father having these two gifts, which I love. Like if you think about what is the role of a father, what is the role of a man, so to speak? Two words stand out. It's to protect and to provide. Yeah, right. You know, and then it was kind of interesting when, when I was reading just about like uh, law in general, it, it kind of pegged those two words. Laws protect individual rights and laws provide a framework for rules and standards with which to maintain order and the common good. So it's amazing to kind of ponder the role of law as well as the role of a father. Order, orderly liberty, right? Ordered liberty. Ordered liberty. There yeah. you go. Well, we're, this program is the law, and there's several of them. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get them right. Fence, right? Uh, but Deep. we'll get it in a minute. But call us if you want to copy this program. 636-447-6000 and tell a friend. Looking for a way to teach your children about our Catholic faith? Colby Academy has the solution. Offering a curriculum that is loyal to the magisterium, classical, Ignatian, flexible, and affordable, Colby can help with all your homeschooling needs. We offer a wide range of services, including live online courses for those looking for assistance teaching their students, recorded self-paced courses for those who want teacher instruction while needing the flexibility to move at their own pace, and traditional homeschool courses for maximum flexibility in home education. Our support services include advising for parents, record keeping and transcript services, a grading service, standardized testing, and guidance and college counseling. For more information, check out their website at colby.org. That's K-O-L-B-E dot org. Or give them a call. Area code 707 707- 255-6499. That's 707-255-6499. It's Colby Academy. St. Joseph Catholic Radio is proud to announce the launch of SJEN TV, the St. Joseph Evangelization Network. SJEN TV is a premier online Catholic broadcasting network providing quality Catholic programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We have programming such as live studio interviews, St. Joe's Java speaker presentations, current Catholic issues, and the Pro Life series. We're featuring the many talented speakers out of Orange County, California, and this Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri including Professor John Gresham, Father James Mason, Karen Nokemper, Rick Hollerick, Bill Federer, and many more. To review the program list, go to sjen.tv or on Roku, sjen.tv. All this programming is free, and we are welcoming sponsorship of new programs. Find out more at sjen.tv. Well, I almost spit it out earlier. You need to go and tell a friend. This is St. Joseph Radio Present, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm your host, Peter Krutz. We're with Sean Miller, who is talking about uh, law of various different types. But before we get back into it, remember two things, please. Seriously, go tell a friend. We're talking about law, something that really makes sense. You know, Mm -hmm. natural law kind of makes sense. But uh, be a blessing to people. Tell them to come and listen. And, And in the in the aftermath, if you will, of this whole Roe versus Wade going down, which it should have gone down a long time ago and mm-hmm. should have never been in there. But remember that we need to be welcoming to people. Remember that most people who are probably anxious, angry, even violent, are probably hurting. Yeah. 
And the way to cure the hurt is to run to our Lord. Put the hurt on his shoulders. He's already taken care of it. Go to confession. Encourage people to go to confession. There's great peace in there. Mm -hmm. Our Lord wants to forgive you. He is dying to forgive you. He came to forgive you. There is no sin that is too much to overcome our Lord's mercy. So please, remember, this is an opportunity to extend the love of Jesus Christ to people. But we're talking about law. Yeah, we left off with talking about uh, fathers, and it's interesting. So first two things, before I forgot, you know, when I read the Supreme Court decision, I uh, and it was really to, I mean, the majority opinion was to speak about how it was egregiously wrong how Roe and Casey were decided, and that it's up to the court to get it right. You know, there's this whole thing we got to stick to precedent. We got to stick to precedent. Well, what if it's a wrong precedent? Plessy you know, versus Ferguson. We, I mean, it was yeah, wrong. look Brown at the history. Versus Board of Education. Look I mean, at the Dred Scott. Case. Dred Scott. Right yeah, here in Missouri, there's there's a lot of bad precedent that it should be overturned. Yeah. People fall. The courts are not infallible. You know, but uh, we're fortunate that we got the protection in the church by Christ Himself to never let the church go in error. But the courts don't have that, so they use their wits, and people can fall under pressures and whatnot. But as he's correcting the law, I thought about the song "America the Beautiful." You know, there's that third verse that says, "America, America." God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. There you go. It's beautiful. And I, I remember it was a book by Scott Hahn. He said his uh, father would always say this line. He said, Scotty, there's no liberty without law. No rules make fools. And I'm like, that's really great because, again, the whole the whole problem with the, the, the law was that this definition of liberty, you know, and it's it's really up to us to kind of Interpret that rightly. Liberty does not mean do whatever you want, whenever you want, and define who you think you are at any time. You know, there's there, there's an ordered liberty to it. And so, like we talk about how you know fathers provide and protect, and you know laws are meant to protect. You know, and it's like that's what the role of a father is to some degree, right? To protect the family, protect his children. I mean, today we got this issue where people want us to, to over overprotect. You know, like it's like you know, I'm not going to do everything for you, or I'm not even going to provide this framework where I'm going to give you everything. You know, so I'm providing an opportunity for you to work and to play and to live, but I'm not going to provide for all your needs. That's what family life is like. That's what the church life is like. That's what the you know the the state is supposed to do is kind of protect make just laws, but provide the framework so that you can thrive. But it's not going to force you to do good apart from your will. But, um, you know, I was thinking of the story about there was a book by Jim Stenson called Father, uh, The Father of the Family Protector. And he said that, like, one day he was at this busy street and this um, grandmother came out and she was blind and she had this the, her seeing eye dog and she was with her two granddaughters and she was walking. Well, here comes this mongrel dog out, you know, a wild dog. And just starts attacking this dog, you know, and the gir the little girls are screaming. Every that's chaos. He said within about 15 seconds, there was about 30 guys surrounding trying to separate the dogs, keep the girls safe, you know, and then kind of accept, you know, just get and make the situation one of kind of peace again. And so it's it's interesting when you think about fathers is that you know they 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 meant to provide protect, but that's what the laws are meant to do. And we place laws around things that we revere. This is a Bishop Barron line that I really like. He said that you think about all the laws just governing driving a car from seatbelts mm. to airbags to various traffic lights. You know, we've got all these laws, uh, and and it's it's why to hinder us. No. It's actually to protect us. Sure. You know, and then you know some. I always hear the say, "Oh, the church has got too many laws," and people are usually referring to that in terms of like you know. Uh, sexuality or, you know, who was a church to determine blah, blah, blah. You know, but you think about we have laws around chastity because the dignity of the human person is so amazing. And then we got to have laws to say you can't use and abuse. And, you, you know, this is a gift. But it's it, when you think about it, though, it's like there's probably more laws surrounding the mass than around chastity because we revere the gift of the Holy Eucharist. You just don't willy nilly. Uh, just say, hey, we're going to do this. Let's bring in whatever we want to to make this a, kind of a kumbaya. Yeah. There's there's kind of a guideline, you know. Right. So for many people, they see law as a burden. But I love the story about uh, there's a story of a duck who was walking around carefree and happy. All of a sudden, one day he felt a great weight being laid upon his back, almost too much to bear. Eventually, he grew tired of carrying the load. He began to grow weary, et cetera, starting to complain until he realized that this burden was nothing other than wings with which he could fly. 
So it's amazing if you think about that that way, is that these, these laws, are like the two tablets of the Ten Commandments or other laws, it's not to weigh you down, it's to give you wings to fly. So laws at its heart are meant to give you freedom for excellence. You know, so like this is probably one of the best things ever learned in the moral life about what rules and laws are for. Anybody that wants to, to thrive at any sport, they are obsessed and concerned and really love the laws because they can all, right. I mean, it's like you think about baseball, you think about football, you got to know the rules to know how to play the game. And if you don't know the rules, then how can you ever become excellent? How can you ever be part of the Hall of Fame because you never played the game well because you don't know the rules? And just imagine if you said, well, hey, anything goes here. You know, uh, you want to get up and, you know, swing the golf club maybe uh, straight ahead or sideways or behind you. It doesn't matter. Anything goes. Well, then what happens? You know, if there's no rules, if there's no guidelines, if there's no enforcement, then it's no fun. I mean, who wants to watch a game where anything goes? I mean, I thought of this analogy. Just take the third commandment and the law to keep holy the Lord's day, right? So now can apply that to the church and compare it to like a sports analogy. So let's say you've got baseball. There's nine players on the field. But let's say you think about people who go to Mass, only three of those nine show up. You know, so every Sunday across the church, about 30% show up for Mass, all right? So let's say you're on Team Church versus Team World, and you only got three players there showing up to play on your side. And then the umpires, who are supposed to be guiding the game, they're hesitant or afraid to call balls and strikes or to call anybody out. So then you got this kind of quandary. Well, then who wants to go to the game and think about how you're going to feel? It's like you never, ever win. We wonder why the church is kind of losing its battle to be a light amongst the nations. It's because we've only got three out of the nine players showing up each week for the fundamental <laughs> gift with which Jesus gave to empower us to live his life. Yeah. But then that's on us three, if you will, to invite the other <laughs> right. nine, or, or however many they are, three, seven. <laughs> Where's my math? Right. I mean, we need to invite people. Yeah, but, but we're kind of carrying the load. And it's, so it's like, praise be to God because he's doing a lot with the three, but it's like, you know, whatever. So if you change laws I mean, and, and everything, it's just no for anybody. And right now this is a debate where it's like, hey— Let's not just change laws. Let's change the nature of the game, being let's change the natural person. So the, like this whole debate about swimming. So if I'm a man and I want to become a woman, I, I can say I can change my nature because that's my right to liberty. And then I can compete in women's sports and dominate. Or let's just say I can take drugs or steroids. It's interesting to me that like, you know, these juices of testosterone or other these, in, you know, performance enhancing drugs, they're outlawed in sports. But then here comes a biological male who's got more testosterone or other, you know, energies that a woman doesn't have. And that but that's still being somehow accepted. So you think about swimming, weightlifting, there's boxing, this these these sports, it's like, Holy cow, when are we going to kind of return to sanity to realize that, you know, this is not good to change the rules of the game because it's going to destroy women's sports. Yeah, hopefully it's starting to stop. But that really is insanity. And fundamentally, as children, we would say, no, you can't go beat up on girls. But <laughs> now it's a, it was institutionalized. I guess the swimming, international swimming yeah. folks, they've said no. I mean, but that's what natural law is, too. I mean, that, that they had to do no more than... Look at natural law. Look at their heart, if you will, and, yeah. and say, you know, I have a rule book with 35 different things, but I know the difference between a girl and a boy, and, yeah. and it's unfair, yep. right? Natural law. Yeah, so it's it's the objective <laughs> natural law. But if, if you think about the sports analogy and you extend that to society, you know, can a society thrive without laws? All these people are, who are clamoring, you know, Defund the police. We're going to have our own home neighborhood watch. Well, let's see how that goes when there's guns and shooting and whatnot. You know, so it's like you think of all the laws from traffic lights to the, 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 the laws on the books that protect societies. So can a society thrive? Sports can't. Society can't. Then you think about the church. And this is one thing that I, I've only heard of one voice who've ever spoken about law in light of the new evangelization, you know, and that's Cardinal Burke. He gave a talk. A few years back, I mean, there's probably more out there, so I don't sure, mean to sure, kind of make sure. a sweeping thing, you know. But, but it's like he he had a talk called "New Evangelization in Canon Law," and so kind of he makes the case that like you know we all want to say welcome home, come back to the church, but you're like, well, what if you're in your fifth 
marriage, you can't really come back. There's a part of canon law that looks at that. It's because we want to make sure that you're able to come and freely be a full part of the society, that the church, the society of, of God, the kingdom of God on earth, it's got guidelines to help us to thrive. So we're inviting you into the society. You know, every year I go through this with RCIA. It's like, I'm inviting you to live according to the guidelines of this society. It's a sacred society, you know? And you know, again, we want to extend our bridge, our gate, but there's also walls to say that we got to live to protect and thrive. So he says that he, he, you know, Cardinal Burke makes the case that that laws enable the freedom for excellence in Christ in the church. And you just can't say, well, anything goes, the church doesn't have laws, we're all free in Christ. It's like that's not really helping the person. It's like saying, come to America, anything goes. You can't say come to the church, anything goes. So, I mean, here's a question, like, how many people... First of all, when they come into the church, or even, let's, let's say all those out there in the church, how many even recognize the Ten Commandments as, as base? You might say kind of, but could you name them? How many recognize kind of like church precepts, you know, like basic laws? How many understands kind of, basic, you know, things about maybe fasting, before, you know, before you receive Holy Communion, the kind of the disciplines at Lent? What are the marriage laws of, of the church? It's like there's this kind of a negative attitude, like, you know, we don't want to stress those because... We don't want to turn people away, but maybe those are the very things that are going to help someone say, I see the perimeter. I see the guideline. I can thrive because I know the law. It's just like in the sports. So in the church, when I know kind of what's expected of me, when I know the perimeter, when I know the fence line, you know, I can say, wow, I can thrive here and not just have this general blanket view of like, God is nice. You're nice. Be nice. Let's just all love one another, whatever that might be, meaning like, well, does that mean feelings of warm affection for one another? Uh, does it mean, you know, is there any difference between, uh, you know, just being nice or truly loving? Because, you know, right now we, we think that uh, if we ever exercise standing up for the law, that it's non-loving. But, but we know that we don't because we're going to probably get some kickback if we do. Welcome well, to parenting. And, and we, yeah, well, that's true. But we need to – and parenting is a great example. But if we look at and church law, for example, mm -hmm. everyone is looking at it in a negative connotation. But the church law is, they, they're not a bunch of no's. They really are a bunch of yeses. You know, yeah. as parents, when we're laying down the law for our children, we're not saying no to them. We're saying, we want you to, we, we don't want you to run out into the street mm -hmm. just to be silly. No, it, it, it's not a no. It's a yes. I want you to thrive and to grow, mm -hmm. right? You have to do your homework. I don't want homework. No, but I want you to be educated and have a wonderful future, right? I want you to go to Mass, right? I want you to have a great relationship with our Lord. All of the church laws that w we, we talk about or rules, they are really yeses. They're, they're yes to you, right? Our Lord is, wants you to be the best and most you can be. Therefore, he gives you these fences, guidelines, Helps. Yeah, they're all yeses. They are not nos. Yeah, I mean it's it's meant again to protect and revere things. So, for instance, like uh, Cardinal Burke speaks about, the main uh, law is in liturgical norms. There's been a real revolt, I think, of people who say like, "How come I can go to one mass here and they seem to be doing this, and then I can go to one mass somewhere else and it seems to be somewhere else? They're playing by different rules." So, imagine if I went to a sports game here and they have you know here's the strike zone. And then over here at a different game, it's, you know, a wider strike zone. Or their first base is, you know, 95 feet instead of 90 or whatever it might be. And, then, and I think that's why there's like, you know, if the church seems to be changing this, there's no kind of central core to the, the celebration of the mass. And it's like, well, is it, do I got to kind of remain open and fluid because maybe they'll change it again tomorrow, et cetera? Do you see how that kind of creates this sense of like, I don't know, I'm not really sure, I'm kind of dejected, it could always be willy-nilly? It's like being on, on, on ice. Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a slippery thing. So, so, so bottom line, you know, we, we got to respect these things and see them in the larger context of the fatherly instruction to help us to thrive and to become excellent at the game. If I want to become holy, virtuous, which is the purpose of life, <laughs> then I should know what the Lord laid down to make that so. So the big law that he laid down is the first one. Again, this is going to be a, a two-part series because we're just kind of starting, but it's the D. Right. So you think about, again, the D in the fence. You're at the sports game. You've, you've got it there. So this D is for the divine law. You know, So what is that going to be? That's going to be ultimately... The Mosaic Law, Ten Commandments, and then ultimately the Sermon on the Mount. There you go. Yeah, this is St. Uh, talk about other laws. I got to say who we are. This is St. Joseph 
Uh, Radio Presents, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. I'm your host, Peter Karutz. We are here in studio live with Sean Mueller, and we're talking about uh, a number of different kind of laws. We're going to go through that memory aid right now. But before I do, let me just mention that uh, you can have a copy of this talk or any, any of them uh, just by giving us a ring, 636-447-6000, 636-447-6000. Happy to send it to you. Help us with the postage, and we're, 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 we're happy to send it to you. 636-447-6000. So we said defense, so D and then F-E-N-C-E. So just to review that it's divine law, then there is family law, then there's ecclesiastical law, then there's natural moral law then there's civil law, all flowing from eternal law, which is the mind of God. So we said that like um, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and uh, he revealed these ten, the, the, there's the two tables. Three have to do with, with relationship with God. The other three have to do with the relationship with one another. And so those, those last seven are what we would recognize as natural law that in case we didn't figure this out on our own using reason, God revealed it. So that's kind of the old law. And then with that, you have what's called the Mosaic Law. So these are all the civil, ceremonial, and moral precepts. I mean, Christ came to kind of um, take the burden of some of the bureaucratic civil and ceremonial laws. He fulfilled them. He said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Those were shadows that he fulfilled in himself, giving us this great new law, the Sermon on on the Mount. But this old law of the Ten Commandments, the moral law, it's never been abrogated. You know, it's still there. It's still part of natural law. So then you've got, again, the old law and the new law. And uh, and ultimately, the gift of the Spirit is that law is no longer on stone. It's within us. So I, uh, years ago, I read something about when um, you see a bishop, he's wearing a mitre, you know, and you're like, somebody said, what's up with the funny hats? You know, and you're like, well, those are, you know, is that reminiscent of the old law priest that had to wear the ceremonial headdress? But I had read uh, two different understandings. I'm not sure which one is right, but they, they're supposed to represent the Old and the New Testaments or the two tables of the law. You think oh, about, oh, you yeah. know, the uh, the mitre, the way it looks, kind of looks like two tables. Pointy hat, Yeah, yeah. But so this this old and the new law, I mean, this is what we're going to speak about first, just the old law. That's like the first stage of um, revealed law. Its moral prescriptions are summed up in the Ten Commandments. They basically, you know, say, here's what's good and here's what's bad. And hopefully all of us know uh, the Ten Commandments, right? Number one, no false gods. Two, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Keep holy the Lord's day. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's good goods. I mean, I really wish that we would consider having these displayed more in churches because we think that everybody knows these things. But if you ask somebody to kind of lay out the ten, they probably haven't really thought about them that much. Now, normally, an examination of conscience helps you to kind of think about those, but those are kind of the core base precepts for you know society to kind of gather. And uh, these were given fifty days after Passover. So on the Feast of Pentecost, back in the day, before we understood it in Christian terms, this was the celebration not just of this you know, harvest festival, but also the giving of the Torah to Mount Sinai. That's going to be a prelude to how we celebrate Pentecost 50 days after Easter, the giving of this new law, the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. So I, I was um, <clears throat> coming just in doing some, some research for this. Uh, do you remember the old Nightline, or was, yeah. it, was, was it Nightline or Dateline? I think it was it was Nightline with Nightline when the hostages uh, were in there. Ted Koppel. Ted Koppel, you got it. Yeah. So uh, he gave a talk in 1994 at Catholic University, and he's talking about truth and society and how society hates the term truth because we all want relativism, subjectivism. But he said uh, he said this. He said, our society finds truth too strong a medicine to digest undiluted. In its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder. It is a howling reproach. What Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not the ten suggestions. They are commandments. Are, not were. The sheer beauty of the commandments is that they codify in a handful of words acceptable human behavior, not just for then or now, but for all times. And that's really beautiful when you you think about just the what the chosen people gave society was really what builds civilization kind of a baseline 
um, moral law. So the publicly recognized standard of moral conduct for not just the Jewish people, not just for Christians, but for the whole world. That's natural law. That's what we all can kind of agree on in what is the common good. So, I mean, praise God for stage one, that that should be kind of the base, first stage, but then stage two is not just a life of thou shalt not. I mean, we were kind of raised with like, my dad always said, you know, just keep the Ten Commandments, you know. But I was like, yeah, but those are kind of mostly negative. Thou don't do certain things. But Christ came to say, no, I want you to do do certain things. Love your neighbor. Do active. You know, I'm going to give you the power to do it. So there's also refrain, but there's also activity. So it's kind of like raising a child, right? Stage one, don't do this. Don't touch that. Don't put that in your mouth. You know, don't put the fork in the in the outlet, et cetera. But then hopefully they reach a point where it's not about just don't do certain things. But now you've incorporated that into your spiritual life, your personal life. And now it's time to get out there and let's do good. Don't just do it because it's this law. Do it because it's 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 a gift of love to others. Yeah. And that's what Christ and the Spirit comes to do. That's right. Yeah. So um, the law basically it's what's given to kind of help us to become holy. It's a it's a it's a tutor. But um, you know, again, like I said, in Galatians five, um, Paul speaks about um, the Mosaic law and how over time. You think about when Christ came, he was saying to the Pharisees, like, you know, you're laying a burden on people. Is that over time, there was like 613 laws that they had kind of adapted from these 10. And it became kind of like this bureaucratic nightmare. Imagine trying to keep this law of all these 613 commandments. You know, so it's like it kind of went way beyond. And so everything became legalism, you know, and it's kind of like the image of Pinocchio. It's like, here's this puppet boy kind of by strings, and he's not really free to act because he's got to do all these various things. And so Paul's reading uh, for this coming weekend in Galatians, it's like, you know, for freedom, Christ set us free from this. Don't submit yourselves to the yoke of the Mosaic prescriptions. Like he talks specifically about circumcision, like, you know, it's baptism, it's life in Christ. You know, one person said, it's kind of like if you were like, think about David and and Goliath, you know, when David was going to fight him, they said, all right, you got to protect yourself with all this armor. You know, and they put the hat and the thing on him. He's like, it just weighed him down. He he wasn't free to act. So sometimes law can become overly negative if it weighs you down. And that's why you got to have somebody to help kind of discern that because, you know, there can become a time when there's too many strings attached. So that's why I like the image of Pinocchio to say, you know, it's time to kind of cut the strings. And that this is when you uh, are free to be a son of God. And now you're to live following your conscience. Remember the whole well informed m- conscience, yeah. Yeah. So the whole movie Pinocchio was about that. You know, you know, Jiminy Cricket was his conscience, right? But we all know the struggle that it took place from going from a, a boy on strings to kind of actually being free. Right. And that's what we all have to kind of fight in our own life. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where um where we're at. Probably I guess for next time we're, we're gonna speak more about um then kind of part two of of this divine law, not just the Mosaic law, not just the Ten Commandments, but then this new law. So it says that Christ came to kind of abolish in his own flesh these ordinances that were kind of probationary for a time. You know, just like raising our kids, you got to somehow quarantine them and keep them protected. And that's what these ceremonial and ritual prescriptions did. It kind of quarantined them from a time to kind of so they wouldn't be kind of infected by the ways of the Gentiles. But then once Christ comes, he, he comes to take that away and gives us the power to say, we no longer need to be separated now. Now it's time to go forth be this light and that's what kind of we're meant to do as Catholics I think it is and the 613 laws I don't know if we could get to them intuitively (laughs) I think they were as you said legalistic so that was the law and if you would like a copy of that program please this program please call 636-447-6000 636-447-6000 and again use this week to go out and spread the word of God not only the word but his love we need to spread the idea that God is here to forgive us and he's running to meet us. I'm not going to see you next week. It is my 30th wedding anniversary. So right. shout out to my wife and glory <laughs> to God. Thank you very much. You've been
listening to St. Joseph Radio Presents from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. If you would like to join us in our evangelization efforts, you can order a copy of today's broadcast or any of our past programs by visiting us on our website, stjosephradio.net. That's S-A-I-N-T, josephradio.net. Or call us, 636-447-6000. It's all at your fingertips to help us evangelize the world, bringing the good news of Christ to everyone you meet and change one soul at a time. Thank you for your prayers and support. Until next time, may God bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of St. Joseph Radio Presents. All right, friends out there in the internet, that was the law. Part one. Part one. I don't know how many parts they're going to be. It's just going to be two parts. So. Yeah, give us the the uh, memory aid again. Defense. So divine law, family law, ecclesiastical law, natural law, civil law, and all flowing into the eternal law. And all of it hoping and praying and God helping us to be the best people we can be. Remember, St. Uh, John Paul said that uh, freedom is not the ability to do whatever we want but it is the opportunity to do what we ought. Yeah. So do what you are ought. Come back, what you ought to do. Come back, see us again, tell a friend about this, and bring the love of our Lord to every pit buddy you meet. Talk to you soon.